Okay, so yet GMO greetings, yet I say we thank you everyone for tuning tuning into this special um, session tonight. So what we're doing, and I'll put this up on the screen right now. So this is our eighth annual Ojiramain Afashe. So Ojiramain means the purified. Ojira, Ojira means pure or purified. Omain means nation in the Akan language. So Ojiramain is the purified nation that deals specifically with Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people in the Western hemisphere. Now, the term Afashe means a festival or cultural event and so forth. So we have our Ojiramain Afashe, typically every year around the summer solstice. We pushed it back this year to the um, close to the first day of fall, which is actually tomorrow. So we're also in the midst of our seven day new year observance. And let me just pull this up on the page right quick so you can see that. For, for those of you who may be unaware, And for those who are unaware, I'm Ojirafo Kwesi Radne Mpata Khan, Ojirafo of Akwamumai and Maruka, the TV movie Akwamu Nation in North America. So this is our page, the Obra Jira page. We have the Apol information on there as well, but Obra Jira is our form of the our Akan New Year. So we're an Akan organization. So when you hear about us talking about the Akan ancestry religion, Akan people. The majority of um, Akan people living between Ghana and Ivory Coast in West Afurika, Afurika had about uh, 12, 13 million Akan people in Ghana, about 11, 12 million uh, Akan people in Ivory Coast. So many of our people who were enslaved from that region and brought to North America, many of us are those direct spirit genetic descendants, just like there were many Yoruba and Igbo and Congo and Mindy speaking people and so forth, Ovambo and Fang and so forth, brought to North America. There were many Akan pe people brought to North America. Some of us know our spirit and their genetic identity, and therefore we continue to practice our culture. In North America, the Akan tradition is the hoodoo tradition, which we're going to get into. But our New Year observance, our New Year begins in the fall. So the first full day of fall, which is Atem Atemet, so-called autumn, named after the deities from ancient Kemet, Atem, the male divinity, and Atemet, the female divinity, but autumn and so forth. The first full day of Atem, Atemet or autumn, is actually tomorrow, the autumn equinox. It's early tomorrow morning, so September 23rd will be the first full day of the that season. That is our New Year's Day. It usually falls either the 23rd of September or the 22nd. We have a seven day New Year observance leading up to that. So this year, the 17th through the 23rd, September 17th through the 23rd, that's our New Year observance. This is the sixth day. Tomorrow is the seventh day. That is our Afe Shia Paz. We say good New Year, happy New Year and so forth. That is the beginning. The fall is a, a seeding time. It's a harvest time, but it's also a seeding time. You harvest the fruits of your labor and so forth, but you also take the seeds and plant them in the ground, the conception, the seeding is a conception. So that's the beginning. And then six months later is the spring when the sprouts break through the surface of the soil, that's a birth, but the conception is the beginning. So, and we're gonna get into more of that cycle, but today is actually the sixth day of our seven day observance. So today is actually New Year's Eve for us. And tomorrow will be the first day of our year 13,024 not 2024, there was no character named Jesus, Yeshua, Esau, and so forth. That's a fictional cartoon character who never existed. We do not track time based on fictional cartoon characters, whether it's Jesus or Allah or Muhammad or Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael or Solomon, Sheba, Menelik or uh, Buddha, or any of these fictional characters that never existed from these fake religions. So we have a real cycle and we deal with that real cycle. So this is the, so the, for, for us, this is New Year's Eve, tomorrow's 13,024. Now, but as we say, normally we have our, so we have our New Year's observance around the equinox, uh, autumn equinox and so forth. Um, we have our Etchy Sign Conference. 
And let's just pull that up. Around the spring equinox, last year was March 25th. We have our Etching Sign Conference where we deal with Afurakani, Afurakani African ancestry religious practice, ancestry religions from the various traditions that we have preserved in our blood circles in North America. The Hoodoo tradition, for example, which is the Akan tradition. Last year, we did a um, joint presentation with Voodoo Queen Galinda Laveau out of New Orleans. We were in New Orleans that, that day. Um, Voodoo is the Eve ancestry religion preserved in North America. Juju, for example, is the Yoruba ancestry religion preserved in the blood circles of our people in North America. Uh, Wanga is the Ovambo tradition preserved in our blood circles in North America. And Gengang is the Fang tradition preserved in our blood circles. You have the Gula and Kisi tradition out of Sierra Leone and so forth, which was preserved and is preserved as the Gullah and Geechee tradition in North America and so forth. So at the spring equinox, we observe our Echi Sign conference and we deal with the different practices, ancestral religious practices, and people are presenting from those different practices specifically of our ancestral religious traditions we preserve in North America. So, but then when we get to around the summer solstice, we have our Ojiramai conference, and we didn't do it this year. We had some things going on this year that changed the schedule slightly. But before this year of 13,023 ended, we wanted to make sure we did this presentation for the Ojita Mine Conference that we would have normally done around the summer solstice in June, around June 22nd and so forth, but we decided to do it today. So now next year, and, and of course we always have our Hudu Mine, Hudu Nation Festival. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. That's always three weeks after our New Year observance. So the middle of October, we have our Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival. That's our first festival of our new year. And then we have the Etchy Sign Conference and the Ojiti Mind Conference and so forth. We have a number of different things going on throughout the year. Now, what is Ojiti Mind? Just for those who are unaware, when you go to our page, and some of you, if, if you clicked on the information, you'll see some of the definitions. <clears throat> and we have presentations from previous years that you can check out posted on the page. They're on the YouTube channel, but posted on the page as well. But just to go over the definitions quickly before we get into the information. Hold on a second. Let me make sure we can... Okay, so you see, Ojiraman, it's an Akan term, but then we trace that Akan term back to our ancestral language of ancient Kanid and Kemet. So it's still used in the Akan language, Ojira, meaning purification, but then we go back further. When we look in our ancestral language, you'll find that the Akan language, just like the Yoruba and Bakango and various languages, we came from ancient Kanit, Nubia, and Kemet and migrated west a couple of thousand years ago and continued our ancestral religious practices. So you will find the languages, the deities, the ritual practices, the culture and so forth is the same because we're the same people. Just like people migrating from Mississippi to Chicago, we're the same people. We migrated from the east portion of Afuraka, Afuraka, Africa to the west, we're the same people. So in the Medutu and the hieroglyphs, you will see that sometimes it's spelled T-W-R-A, but also the hand with the open palm faced upward is the D sound, as you can see here. And the little swallow, the bird, is the ur sound and so forth. So DWR is jira. And you'll see it says to be clean, to cleanse, to purify, to celebrate a ceremony of purification. That's what jira. And we have the proper um, vocalization because we still utilize that term. So in Akan, jira or jira, 
means to cleanse, to sanctify, to consecrate. And then you have, that's the verb, jira. And then you have ojira, which means purification. But you also see it says the yam custom annual festival celebrated in the month of August or September when the first yam is eaten and begin, being considered also the beginning of a new year. And it says, wo twa ojira wo kumasi in Aquam, which is Aquamu, which is us, Aquamu Nation in North America. Um, they're talking about the different places that celebrate ojira and so forth, but it means to purify purification, the purification of the land and so forth and the people to move into a new cycle, to move into a new year clean and so forth. So purification, but also to celebrate a ceremony of purification. In ancient Kemet, when it says jira means to cleanse, to purify, and also to celebrate a ceremony of purification, what is that ceremony of purification that they're talking about? The very same ceremony of purification that we continue to practice for thousands of years up until this very moment. And on the continent, August to September, around that time, it shifts for them by the year. They have their seven day observance in most places here in North America. Ours is calibrated to the autumn equinox. So it's the six days leading up to the equinox and the seventh day is our New Year's day. So we continue that practice. We said in our con, the term Omain means nation, people and so forth. In ancient Kemet, Main or Mainu, means a town or a city, as you can see here. But mine or Mainu also means the land of the setting sun, the West. And then when we scroll down, You'll see mine to twist, to turn around, mine, a monument or pillar, mine or my new, a town or city, mine, also my new, land of the setting sun, the west. And then this is from the Akan language dictionary. Mine to turn or go aside, to turn in somewhere from the way or journey. Just like you had mine to twist, to turn around. And then in Akan, you also have Omain, a town, the inhabitants of a town as a political body, a community, the body of inhabitants of a country, united under the same government, a nation, tribe, people, state. So mine meaning to twist or to turn, mine also meaning a nation, a state, a group of people under the same government. And if you think about someone moving, walking down a road and so forth, a long path, and then they turn off of the road and there's a great community of people all working for a common good and so forth. When they turn off mine, they're inside of an oh mine, a nation. Mine to turn off, mine, a nation. That's akin to if you look at your blood vessels carrying blood, they're moving through, the blood's moving through the vessels. Then it turns off the path and goes into a community of individuals who are working together for a common purpose that community of individuals or cells comprise an organ, a nation, quote unquote, a structure that these different cells are all working together to help maintain, whether it's the liver or the spleen and so forth, that organization or collective of cells working together under a common, quote unquote, government is an omain or a nation. When you're moving down the road or the blood vessels and so forth and you turn mind and you end up in an omain, a collective body. This is the definition, this is the cosmology behind mind meaning to twist or to turn and mind meaning a collective of people working together under the same government. But again, what's important is the same terms that you find in ancient Kemet, mind to turn or to twist and mind meaning, you know, a nation or state, you find the same two definitions in the Akan language. But you also find Mine, meaning the land of the West, the setting sun. And then you have Amain, Oni, a foreign country abroad and so forth. 
So we are the purified Ojida, Omain nation in the mine, the West, the land of the setting sun. We are at the extreme West of Afuraka, Afrika in Africa. We are, you know, those who landed in the West, but once we returned to our culture, we purified ourselves. Now we're the purified Omain, Ojida Omain, the purified nation. Afrikaani, Afrikaani people in the Western Hemisphere. Now, and then the focus. Let's just scroll back up real quick. We say Ojida Maya Fashe which is the Gina Mind Conference, is the recognition and reintegration of these principles ritually and communally, operationalized via our principal values of Shea and Shebiya, Trustery, religion, judgment, maturity, revolution, resolution, relationships, Sankofa Protocol. We deal with Amaniye, which is nationism, the purification of nationalism, an approach to nation building, restoration, rooted in our ancestral religious values, and when we say amai and sesiu, nation building, restoration, seseo means to restore. And of course, amai or amai means the nation. That is nation building, specifically meaning nation restoration. Our seven principal values of nation building, restoration, amai and sesiu, is methods of food production and preservation. You can't have a nation without having methods of food production and preservation. If you were to move to the continent of Afuraka, Afrika, and set up an, an independent you know, space or somewhere in the United States and so forth and establish a sovereign space, you couldn't be dependent on the enemy to feed you. If you escaped from enslavement and went into a sovereign territory and so forth, like our successful ancestresses and ancestors did during enslavement, freed themselves, killed the whites in Arl Springs, set up an independent sovereign state, like in Dismal Swamp and some other places, they had to have methods of food production and preservation to feed everyone in the new nation. The second piece is the methods of curing disease. You can't be dependent on your enemy who you just escaped from to cure you in your new nation. You have to have methods of curing disease rooted in our ancestral culture, ritual medicine, root work and so forth, everything. Third principle value, establishment of a military structure. When you have methods of food production and preservation, you can feed the nation, you can cure everyone in the nation. Now you have to defend because you know our, when you know, understand the nature of our enemies, the whites in our spring, they will seek to destroy anything we build. We've seen that with Black Wall Street and anything else that we've ever built. When you understand who we are and understand who our enemy is, you know they are parasitic, they are cancerous cells in the body of Black humanity, they will seek to consume and destroy anything that we build, just like cancer cells move through the body, seeking to consume and destroy anything that's healthy. The only interaction that we have with cancer cells, uh, wise, intelligent interaction, is to isolate them, kill them, and expel them from the body. There's no negotiation with the enemy. So when we're talking about establishing an independent sovereign space, we do not integrate with our enemies under any circumstances. Just like healthy cells don't integrate with cancerous cells. So you must establish a military structure just like your, your body has an immune system, lymphatic system. It doesn't matter if you have any other system in your body that's working wonderfully, the respiratory system, circulatory system, integumentary system, or whatever, whatever it is. If you don't have an immune or lymphatic system, everything is gonna fall apart. Same thing with a nation. Uh, fourth principle value, the institutionalization of values, establishing institutions, training institutions, educational institutions, industrial, cultural, religious, to instill and ins institutionalize the values of the nation into every single individual in that collective. We have establishing sound systems of governance and jurisprudence so that when we have conflicts, we know how to resolve conflicts so small you know, conflicts don't um, expand into great conflagrations where we destroy the nation from inside or weaken ourselves so that the enemy from outside can come and destroy us. So, and of course it facilitates the longe longevity of the nation intergenerational. Building of homes on acquired land in our own territory. So that's land acquisition, 
building and so forth, sustaining all of that. And then of course, the manufacturing of clothing. So every element <clears throat> that we need in order to be a nation, whether we're on this continent, or on, on the Afurakani, Afurakani, the African continent and so forth, just like our ancestors as an ancestors who were successful in freeing themselves and establishing independent sovereign spaces right here on the continent, they had to have these seven principal values rooted in our ancestral religious values. And that's the difference. When we talk about Amanie or nationism, we're talking about Amain Sesu nation building restoration rooted in our ancestral religious values. <clears throat> now, you hear about, we say Amaniism, Amanie or nationism. Let's pull up that. So we say Amani is a tree term for things of the nation. So Amain means nation, Adie means things, objects, deeds, or entities. Amani means things of the nation. So we utilize that term for nationism. And we say that's the purification of nationalism. So we have a, we, we did a four week course on that and let's just pull that up real quick so you can see it. This is one of the four week courses that you can access in any time on our site. So we just wanted to highlight this before we get into the subject matter, but Amanie, nationism, the purification of nationalism. So you you can, it's four week course, you can get into that detail. But when we look at nationalism, black nationalism, pan-African nationalism, and so forth, various expressions of nationalism over the past hundred plus years, well, one thing that we can say is that nothing has been successful. We're no closer to <clears throat> independence, sovereignty, and, and security within our sovereignty. We're no closer to that today than we were 100 years ago. So the various approaches to Black nationalism, Pan-African nationalism, Black power, whatever we use, whatever's been going on for the past 100 years, it has not been effective. Clearly, we can see that clearly. Some people don't want to admit to that reality. They want to try to use the same old programs that they've been holding on to for 100 years or 60 years or however long it's been, saying that we just need to push these same approaches and we'll get to where we need to be. But we've been pushing that for a century, over a century. It has not been effective. So we need to go back to what worked. Our people who were enslaved, they freed themselves in their lifetimes. So, okay, somebody was saying in the chat room they couldn't see. Um, let me know in the chat room if you can see and clear, uh, see clearly. If anybody else is having a problem seeing or hearing. Or anybody else, just po any anybody, if you can post a message, let me know if you can see. Okay. So if you can't see somebody saying that they can, everything is clear on their side, you might have to reboot or go out and come back in. Okay. Okay, so we just wanted to touch on that quickly. Now, when you look at the flyer, we go into detail about that and we show the linguistic aspect of it. And when you go to the Ojita Mind page, it's in the chat room. We The first three conferences, the first three Ojita Mind conferences, we published a journal for each one of those conferences. You can download those three books for free. And we go into detail about not only the philosophy, but we have different articles on nation building, restoration, and various things that were going on, not just for that year, but uh, for the nation, nature and function of nationism. Okay, so let's get to the topic we want to deal with.
Now, in February, every year we have our Happy Merit, our retreat on Edisto Island in South Carolina. <clears throat> we just posted some information about that. And let's go to that page right quick so you can see quickly what we're talking about. And we did, we recently posted the a video trailer for that upcoming event, but this is in February. Hold on one second. Let me make sure this is... I just want to make sure it looked like the video was saying that it was private. I just want to make sure it's not. <clears throat> just want to make sure you can see it. So hold on a second. Okay, so we just posted this video, um, and in February, we have the Happy Mary Retreat, Hibernation Retreat, Edisto Island, South Carolina, one of the Gullah Sea Islands and so forth. It's an Amaniye, a nationism, nation building retreat and so forth, where we have workshops and um, we go over information dealing with nation building, restoration and so forth. So, so we just wanted to show that real quick, but, and that was some of the, it's also a cultural and ritual retreat. So we do have ritual on these ancestral lands um, where our people were not only enslaved, but also freed themselves, established independent sovereign maroon settlements on Edisto Island. It has that ancestral energy there. We do ritual at the ocean and so forth, but we also have, um, you know, uh, workshops and so forth. So we can get strengthened within our nation building capacity, restoration capacity. So when we go back out into the community, we can build and expand and impact the community for the remainder of the year on a positive note. Okay, so. But one of the things that came out of that session this past February, um, we went into some detail about this notion of ohiadie. Now, in the Akan language, the term ohiadie means thing, object, deed, or entity. Ohia has a couple of different definitions. So on the verb side here, I mean, to distress, perplex, trouble, straighten, press with poverty or other necessity to be urgent and so forth. To be required or needful. It can deal with poverty but all, and indigence, but also want or necessity. But then ahiasem, a matter of necessity, urgent matter, that which is needed. Now, when somebody 
He used something for poverty saying, you know, if you're in poverty, that means you really need something, but something that is urgent, that's a necessity, that's a priority. When we say ahi asim, asim in Akam means um, issues or affairs and so forth. And ahia, plural ohia, the issues or affairs, asim of ohia, that which is of a necessity or an urgent matter. So when we talk about ohia, die, in that sense, we're talking about things, objects, deeds, or entities, adie, which are ohia, which are necessities. That means that they are priorities. When we're talking about the nation building, nation restoration concept, there are certain things that are in place that are necessary for us to engage nation building in a purified, functional way. We see a number of people dealing with nation building, nationalism, black power, talking about building the community and so forth and what we need to do as a people. But then you see a lot of things falling apart in these organizations. How effective are our people being? We talked about philosophically, if you're trying to tie your nationism or your nationalism to pseudo religion and fictional cartoon characters, like the root of your nationalism being Judeo-Christian values, like with Marcus Garvey and so forth, or some people with the Nation of Islam, or some people with these false ideologies, and you're trying to take, tether your nation building apparatus to a fake Eurocentric ideology based on fake characters and fake religions that have no basis in reality, then that's not functional for our people. So we said we deal with nation building rooted in our ancestral religious values in order to be effective in impacting the community when we leave these kinds of spaces and go back into the community after we become fortified with information that's powerful and we wanna build Afro-Rakani manhood, Afro-Rakani womanhood, dealing with entrepreneurship, if you're into healing practices and so forth, or investing or architecture, whatever you're involved in, if you want to impact the community in a positive way that's leading towards different expressions of my ancestry nation building, there are certain things that are necessities before we can move forward now and as we're moving forward. Now we're going to look at these four different pieces. We have the, you see the fire, water, earth, and air elements. And then we have these different understandings with regard to what that's, that's about. Each one of these names are names of, they're in the Akan language, but they're names of certain courses that we did. We did whole entire courses on these different aspects. Nkom first, we're looking at the base of the root. Let's look at that, just so you can get an idea of what we're dealing with. So we did a uh, four-week online course, the four elemental rituals of spirit communication, practical instruction, Oshue, Nkomre, Susuho, and Okragwari, which means libation, ancestral shrines, meditation, soul, spiritual head cleansing. And then we define that, but then we go in detail to show people how to pour libation, how to establish an ancestral shrine, how to engage in ritual meditation in a focused manner, how to engage in ritual cleansing the head and so forth. And we talk about that. Now, the next one that we have, we're gonna go through these quickly and then we're gonna go through them one by one. The next one is Adebisa, Elemental and Totemic Divination. We did a four week um, uh, course on that. Plant totems animal totems, mineral totems, human totems. You have water gazing, fire gazing, mineral casting, spirit possession, different forms of divination or communicating with the spirit realm, your ancestresses and ancestors who are connected to you, as well as the forces of nature who are connected to you and so forth. We're gonna get into that. The next one is Intain, elemental asceticism in the Hoodoo tradition.
And we talk about the, those elements and then we have ascetic traditions and not just with the hoodoo tradition, but the ascetic tradition comes from ancient Kanid and Kemet. When people talk about Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism and these different you know, practices and they talk about being ascetics and so forth, we, they learned about that from the priests and priestesses from ancient Kemet and then corrupted that practice into what they're doing now. But so things like fasting and dieting and uh, ritual movement and abstinence and so forth, all those things are part of ritual purification to strengthen, edify yourself so you can be grounded enough and focused enough and clear enough to make a positive impact in, with regard to nation building on my ancestry within the community. And then we have Ahosain, elemental restoration, grounding, rooting, sprouting, flowering. That's the, the cycle of life and so forth. But when you become grounded, spiritually rooted, fully flowering, sprouting, fully flowering in your actions and so forth, you make a positive impact. If you become corrupted to a certain extent, you're not purifying yourself. Just like if you're if you have a pure diet and you're getting enough sleep and exercise and so forth, you function properly. If you pollute yourself by putting alcohol and other drugs or, you know, all kinds of foods that create disease within your body, then you start functioning in an ill manner. The same thing happens spiritually when you put certain things in your spirit, the things you see, hear, experience, and you incorporate those things and hold on to them or obsess over them and so forth, then that grounding degenerates into addiction. That rootedness degenerates into depression. Fully flowering or sprouting and expressing yourself in a harmonious way that impacts other people to motivate them to better themselves and engage in activities that are furthering of nation building that degenerates into anxiety. The full flowering of your, you, you know, of your capacities and so forth in the community that positively impacts people that degenerates into irateness and so forth and self-destructive behavior. So we, and when you look at that addiction, depression, anxiety, irateness, if you look at those different expressions and then you see some of that manifesting in people who should be leaders or people who should be teaching people something or guiding people in a certain way, if people are controlled by these things, you look at these different organizations, why did these different organizations that seem to have good information fall apart? What, what happened to the leadership in these different organizations? You'll see a number of different things. You even look back to when we look at this notion of discipline. Second. You'll see, for example, we talk about diet and fasting, sexual activity and abstinence, ritual movement and meditation, exercise and balance. You'll see people with large organizations influencing large numbers of people, but then because they're corrupted with regard to sexual activity, they're not disciplined, then the whole organization falls apart because they're either promiscuity or infidelity or even something as perverse as molestation and so forth. And you have these people tanking the entire organization and everything it's about because they can't engage in normal Afurakani, Afurakani culture, which includes entang, which includes discipline and so forth. Now, if you don't have these things as priorities from the outset, then your nation building activities are gonna fall apart at some point. They can't be overlooked. Ohiadie, things, objects, deeds, or entities, adie, that are okia of necessity or of an urgent nature that are critical to the success of nation building. Now we're gonna start off with Nkong, the earth element, we'll just start off there. So what does Nkong mean? What, what does it have to do with nation building and so forth? Let's go to one of our articles, but first we're gonna Go right back to that. 
So we talk about ritual practice and we talk about the definition of calm. Now, let's go to an article that we published a while back. I call it calm, spirit possession, spirit communication, the key to understanding cosmology. And we just want to show a definition right quick. In the Akan Dictionary, calm is comprised of ko, which means to go, and mu, which means within. So komu means to go within. Komu, which is contracted, and komu becomes kom, to enter, to penetrate, to go in. Kom, to bend, bow, incline, to turn aside. And then you'll say, Calm to dance wildly in a state of frenzy or ecstasy, ascribed by the natives to the agency of a fetish, meaning a deity, to be possessed by a deity. And then it says, the fetish man or a priest or priestess to prophesy, to soothsay, to foretell. So when the spirit comes down upon somebody, the spirit of an abosom, a deity, the spirit of one of the insamanfo, ancestor or ancestress, they become possessed by a divinity one of the forces in nature that animates the sun or the moon or oceans or rivers and so forth, animates these features of creation. When one of those spirits enters into us, then that same force that regulates order and creation, it operates within the human population to establish order, the same kind of order you see out in creation to establish order in the community so we can be regulated and operating harmoniously just like creation is operating harmoniously. We can't have a nation building process unless we have a pre-existent order that we understand and we put things in place. All of our educational institutions, training institutions, cultural institutions, military institutions that are in harmony with one another based on the order that we see in creation. We wanna put that same order and establish that same order in our society as Afurakani, Afurakani people so we have a harmonious society. Those seven principal values of nation building, methods of food production and preservation, curing disease, establishing military structure, establishing institutions, sound systems of governance and jurisprudence, the building of homes on acquired land and the manufacturing of clothing, all those different things must be integrated in a harmonious fashion for a sovereign, sound, strong nation to be established and, and perpetuated. So when a force in nature, a force of divine order gets inside the body of the people and operates within the population. We wanna extend that creative order within the population. So, komu, kong, spirit possession and so forth. One becomes possessed, the spirit comes down upon them, they become heavy with the spirit. The person can bend or bow or incline because the spirit is resting upon them and so forth. So that's the relationship between kong, meaning to bend or bow, kong to enter, to penetrate, Palm to spirit possession, spirit communication. And then we look in ancient command, calm to bend, to bow and so forth, to gain the mastery, to have influence over someone, that spirit possession, same term, same meaning and so forth, nature command. Kema, which is really comma, to grasp, to seize, to lay hold upon, to hold, to possess. We see okom means hunger. And akom, the state of being possessed with this fetish, meaning a deity and so forth. Nkom, oracle communication, message delivered by the supreme being. And then you have calm to embrace and the two arms embracing and so forth. Palm, meaning neck or throat, that is the place of possession where the food is consumed. And just like you consume food and it goes into your system and then empowers you and the spirit enters into the body, it's like a quote unquote consumption, so to speak, that spiritual energy gets inside of you and empowers you. And then ko, to fall into ecstasy, to prophesy during a frenzy. That's the term in ancient Kemet. And that's the same root of the term Calm, as shown in, in Akan, to dance wildly in a state of frenzy or ecstasy, uh, to prophesy and so forth.
So this is why this particular piece we talk about um, to go within spirit possession and so forth. The four major forms of income, libation, ancestral shrines, meditation, okra guare. If we deal with okra guare, which is soul washing. You see someone cleansing their head and so forth, purifying their head, just like you take, you know, you take a shower, take a bath and so forth and cleanse the debris from you physically to purify yourself or you internally go on a fast, go through a detox and you purge yourself of waste, purge yourself of any microscopic parasites or parasites like tapeworms and different things and so forth that are causing, you know, health problems and so forth just like we do that internally, physically, and externally, physically, spiritually, we engage in the same process. When you take, well, when, when you engage, when you take certain ritual elements and so forth to cleanse the spiritual head, that's okra guare in the Akan language, the washing guare of the okra, okra the soul, the divine consciousness and so forth. Just like you pull debris off of your head by cleansing it, you take the negative energy debris, the ritual process to pull that away from the head, that kind of negative energy debris that's attached itself to you. Sometimes other people's energy projections, thoughts, um, desires and so forth, misguided desires. Just like if you can walk through a, a space where someone's smoking and then once you come through that space or if it was in a restaurant and so forth, then your clothes smell like the smoke. And now you walk into a building and you go to work at something and somebody says you smell some smoke. You walk through a place, you walk by people who have no connection to you whatsoever, but because you moved through that space, something was attached to you and you brought it to the workplace or you brought it home. And then you need to cleanse yourself of that. The same thing happens spiritually when you move throughout the course of the day and so forth. Sometimes we wear certain talismanic implements or we engage in ritual processes to repel such negative entities, spirits, projections, and so forth. But just like you walk throughout the course of the day and you pick up energy, people sneezing, you can pick up microbes and so forth. You can bring that home and become sick and, and transfer it to your children and your spouse and so forth, or go to work and you can pick up somebody else's viral you know, agent and then transfer that to other co-workers and they, everybody becomes sick. In the same fashion, you just move throughout the course of the day. Hold on one second and make sure my, okay. In the same fashion, when you move throughout the course of the day, people's projections are always happen. Ne people who you're not connected to, as well as people who you are connected to. Most people's projections bounce off of you. their thought projections, their energetic projections. You can feel that, you can experience it, just like you can experience someone staring at you and then you look up and you see them staring heavily at you. Or you can think about somebody you haven't thought about in, in, in years and then they pick up the phone or they call you right at the moment that you're thinking about them and so forth. That's an energy projection. No different than calling somebody on the phone on the other side of the country. That's an energy projection from one device to the next. The frequency is picked up and they pick up the phone and so forth. We can do the same thing our nervous system facilitates that. Our nervous system and the electromagnetic energy in our nervous system is connected to the magnetosphere, the electromagnetic field surrounding the planet. So these transmissions are sent across back and forth. So people's projections typically bounce off of you or they, they have some, you can feel it, but they don't consume you. But if you're not spiritually strengthened or purified, if you're not grounded, somebody's negative projections, whether it's deliberate or not deliberate, you can pick that up, hold on to it and, and operate based on that. And you have these negative influences and you come home with this negative energy or you engage with the person you're in a relationship with this negative energy or some discarnate spirit of an ancestor or a non-relative in the home, around the home or out in the community or out somewhere if you're spiritually receptive these discarnate spirits who are still hanging around earthbound, their negative energy can attach to you or even follow you and so forth. And then you feel this negative energy. So what we do is we cleanse ourselves, cleanse the spiritual head, 
to get that those negative projections out. So we're not influenced by someone else or something else. We're only influenced by the divinity that governs our head, our own spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, as well as the divinities that govern us. We engage in ritual purification, cleansing the spiritual head. That's one part of that susuhon or meditation, focused observation. When we sit down at the Nkomre, the ancestral shrine, when we sit down after pouring libation, that's the water element. And that Nkomre is the establishing an ancestral shrine, grounding the energy of your ancestresses and ancestors in a certain space in the home so you can have a focused communication. You can communicate with them anywhere, but if you want to have a focused communication, you sit down, become grounded, and focus. Just like you can have a communication with somebody if you're running down the street and they're running across the street on the other side, you can yell at each other while you're running and you can hear them and they can hear you. But if you want a full optimal communication, you'll stop running, you'll sit down, you'll focus on each other and you'll have a full communication. We can communicate with our Nsamanfo, our ancestresses and ancestors wherever we are in the world because they're connected to our bodies and our spirit bodies. But when you want to have a focused communication, you stop everything else and then you focus and you ground their energy in a certain space so you can have a full communication. That's also a purificatory element as well in the home to repel other negative spirits, relatives or non-relatives who are negative from coming into the home so you have a purified environment. So, and then you can sit down and have focused observation in tune observation, susu, hon. susu means to meditate and so forth in the Akan language. And hon means the self, susu meaning to reflect upon, and hon means the self. So susu hon means to reflect upon the self and so forth that's reflecting internally. So these are things that we do to purify our minds, clear our spirit bodies of negative energy debris so we can be fully present, focused, grounded so when we make decisions whether we're building you know engaging in collaborations with individuals we're clear mentally we're clear spiritually we're clear culturally so we can have a, a proper interaction a proper collaboration you don't want to bring a great deal of trauma and negative energy misguided ideas misguided emotionalism and so forth to a nation building uh, process that doesn't benefit us at all if you've been working along with individuals or you've come in contact with individuals, if you're in some kind of nation building practice or process, or you're learning about that and you wanna see how we can do something to build our people, sustain our people, strengthen our people, defend our people and so forth, become independent economically, socially, politically, and you either see an organization or a group of individuals or one individual, you're learning about that, and you see they're controlled by misguided emotionalism and misguided ideas, even though they might be a nice person and so forth, but they, they're controlled by misguided emotionalism, misguided ideas, um, foolish concepts that they incorporate. And you're trying to see how can they be focused on a real nation building process when they're operating in this fashion. We have to start off one of these necessities, ohiadie, necessities to become grounded is mm calm. Spiritual purification starts with that process of mm calm, getting grounded, purified, cleansing yourself, and all of that. So that's the mm calm piece there. So that's why we have grounding the earth element. The mm calm is that earth element. It's the grounding element, establishing an ancestral shrine, pour libation, bring the spirits in and so forth, sit down, establish a shrine, focused observation, meditation, susunho, purification, purifying the spiritual head and so forth. So you can see clearly, hear clearly, know what your function in the world is and so forth, how to execute that function, know what your energy capacities are, what your talents are, what kind of activities you should be engaged in. If you're a child of a fiery divinity, you're naturally inclined towards fiery activities like defense and so forth. If you're a child of an earth divinity, naturally inclined towards agriculture or a number of different things associated with the earth element, 
whatever your energy capacities are, you have certain occupations you're naturally drawn to that will contribute to the building of the Oman of the nation. But you have to become clear on that and not negatively influenced by other people's projections, living or deceased. And you will see a lot of individuals talking about nation building, secular nationalists and so forth, who have some good ideas and some misinformed ideas and so forth. And there are reasons for that. There's no spiritual purification or grounding. So no spiritual purification or grounding behaviorally means they can be pulled in different directions. But intellectually, that means they're pulled in different directions because they're not grounded or clear enough to see through the misinformation. They're controlled by misguided emotionalism or other people's you know, nostalgic ideas about what nationalism is or what maybe they used to listen to Malcolm X speeches and so forth. And they will say, well, we just need to put in place what Malcolm was teaching because they were emotionally attached to you know, his personality even though he was misguided because he was practicing a fake religion and didn't understand nationism in the full sense. He never got a chance to get to that. So some people will incorporate ideas that are not workable at all because they are not clear, they're not grounded. We're talking about nationism, the purification of nationalism. Nationism, nation building, restoration rooted in our ancestral religious values. It is a necessity, a necessity, to become grounded spiritually first before you even think about nation building. Now, the next piece, the air element, Adebisa, well, let's look at what Adebisa is talking about. Okay, so there was a question in the chat room. Are certain individuals from the Oman needed for an Okomfo, Okomfowa to experience a full possession? If not, what is needed? Is there even a such thing as not having a full possession? So, so the first question you're saying, are certain individuals from the Oman, from the nation needed for an Okomfo, Okomfowa to experience a full possession? So, Okonfo means priest or priestess. It's a certain class of priest or priestess. That's, that's the, occur, the term in the Akan language. Uh, just like you have Olorisha in the Yoruba language, which is a priest or a priestess. In Akan, one of the kinds of priest or priestess is the Okonfo. And Kon is the root, as you can see. Okon, Kon meaning possess. So those who get possessed. So, so you're asking if that's part of the function that's one of the functions. So the priesthood, priesthood, in fact, that's the very next thing. Adibisa, priesthood, priesthood, that is essential to nation building. Because those who are priests and priestesses, they get possessed by the deities. And let's just show real quick. Um, Okay, so this is our Akaradin Boson page. And we just want to show this chart real quick. Okay, so when we talk about the Akan on Boson of the seven days of the week, the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven days of the week, and you see Akan people named Kwesi and Kojo and Kwame and so forth, and we're named after these different divinities. So the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven day week, each day of the week is governed by one of these solar, lunar, and planetary bodies. And there are spiritual forces that animate each one of these solar, lunar, and planetary bodies, male and female forces. The movements of these solar, lunar, lunar and planetary bodies regulate all the natural cycles on earth and all natural cycles within our bodies and so forth. We have the Images from ancient Kemet, as they're expressed in ancient Kemet. Their names in ancient Kanedian Kemet, but also their names in the Akan language. So Awusi, the male divinity governing the sun on Sunday. Essi is the female divinity, but that's Osar. 
Ajua, that's our set governing the moon and so forth. Abena in Akan is Sekhmet. Bena is Herubedet. So if you see, for example, a male name, Kwa Bena, that means Kwa, a servant of Bena, the deity Bena. If he's born on Tuesday, he's going to be called Kwa Bena, or a servant of the deity Bena. He was born on Bena Da, the day, the Da of the deity Bena. The planet Bena, so called Mars is the sanctuary or the planetary you know, shrine of this divinity. He is called Ogun in Yoruba and Ogun in Vodun. He's Heru Bedeti or Heru Behudet in ancient Kemet, the divinity of iron and war and fire and so forth. He's called Benna in Akan. People are, he, he governs the, as you can see here, the immune system. That is his shrine within your body. On earth, it's the thermosphere and so forth, but People who are children of that warrior divinity have warrior inclinations like police and, you know, uh, uh, military and so forth, security, people wielding weapons and so forth, even surgeons who take, you know, metal weapons and go into the body and cut out a tumor and remove it to, you know, purify and heal the body and so forth, using metal weapons to, you know, destroy disorder and preserve the integrity of the body. It's like a warrior will take metal weapons to kill the enemy, the tumors in the body of the community to preserve the integrity of the body. So somebody who's a Kwa Bena will have that fiery kind of energy. Matter, matter of fact, Malcolm X was born on a Tuesday. He was a Kwa Bena. Of course, he manifested that kind of Kwa Bena, a fiery energy. A woman born on Tuesday, a female is Abena. That's the female divinity born on Tuesday or Benada, Abenada. She is called Sekhmet in ancient Kemet. She's called Sechima in Akan. She's also called Abena. So a female born on Abenada or Tuesday is called Abena, a child of the female divinity, Abena. And she carries that fiery energy as well as she governs the lymphatic system in the body. So when you have people who are children of these divinities, there are certain people, some people are naturally drawn to, for example, Ame and Men governs the skeletal system. So people who are naturally a child of that divinity, some of those people are naturally inclined towards that kind of work. So they're naturally inclined towards structural entities. So they'll be inclined towards architecture, for example, mechanical engineering, that kind of thing, because those are the structures that are built that support and, you know, uh, you know uh, high rises and buildings and all different kinds of things. So they can be artistic, but they are, they are also in, um, interested in things that are structurally sound. So they are a child of a divinity that governs the structure that, you know, erects and holds up the body. And they move into an area of the community wherein they have that kind of function, you know, in the community and it's reflected in their energy complex. Somebody else, as we said before, can be a child of an earth divinity. They're naturally inclined towards agriculture and working with the earth. Somebody else can be a child of a, you know, earth divinity, and they're more inclined towards procuring medicine from plant life and mineral life because they're naturally inclined. They're part of that energy complex, and they're drawn to spending a great deal of time within nature, dealing with plant life and mineral life and extracting the substances needed to cure the diseases that people know about, as well as new diseases that manifest. They have the capacity to go into nature and grab the things that are needed and curate things that are needed to heal them. And then you have people with regard to the question that's asked that are the mediums for these forces to possess and bring that energy into the community so we can all learn and, and bond with that and build from that. So that's essential to the nation building process. And that's why Nkong is also not only individually a necessity, Nkong, to go within spirit possession, purification. On an individual level, you need to purify yourself, go inward, cleanse your spiritual head, engage in susu home meditation, reflection and so forth, internal reflection. But as a community, we need to go within, Nkong. And part of that process are the communal agents of Nkong, which is Okonfo, Okonfoa, priests and priestesses who become possessed by the deities, when the deities possess, they show the person how to heal or procure medicine from plant life and mineral life. They get, get possessed by the ancestral spirits who are spiritually cultivated. They teach and guide and guide us away from negative things. 
We're about to go grab a plant that's poisonous. They will stop us from doing that. We're about to go, you know, engage in some activity that's, that's going to lead to something destructive along the way. They can stop us from that and show us why that kind of activity will be self-destructive for the individual as well as for the nation. So. And this next piece actually leads into that question as well. <clears throat> so the air element is adebisa. So you become grounded and so forth and purified so you can be clear, you know, direct and so forth, clear mind. Let's look at what adebisa means and that actually touches on <clears throat> what we were just speaking of. That one, okay. So we did a four week course on Adebisa. Adebisa is the term for divination in the Akan language. So we say the Akan term Adebisa means divination. The root Bisa means to ask, to inquire. Adie means thing, object, object deed or entity. So Adebisa means things, objects, these are entities, adie, that are inquired or asked about. <clears throat> so when someone says ko bisa, mean, that means ko, to go, bisa, ask. They're going to the priest or priestess who gets possessed by the divinity to ask them what the deities, what the forces in nature or the ancestral spirits, the insamanful, have to say about a situation, whether it's a health issue, whether it's a social issue, a relationship issue, a business issue, a nation building issue, what is in harmony with divine order with regard to what, how we need to move forward? What's the best means by which to move forward that's in harmony with order, that's furthering of the nation, also furthering of your own individual development. So that's what Adebisa is about. Now, in this particular course, we talked about different forms of Adebisa. You see fire, water, earth, and air. You have nsio, which is water, oja, fire, asase, earth, and from air. You have people who engage in water gazing, looking into water, and the spirits will show them what's happening. Some people fire gaze. Some people cast minerals, mineral casting, shells, bones, stones, and so forth. And then the air element, spirit possession. That has to do with akon. Now, you often hear about animal totems, for example. You see the head of the habui bird, so-called crane or ibis. Um, that's an animal totem for the deity, Tehuti, a sacred animal totem and so forth. Just like there are animal totems, certain animals are fiery, certain animals are cool and watery, certain animals are, you know, earth animals, some are in the air and so forth. They are children of specific divinities. This is why certain animals, you know, you have their feathers or their bones and it carries the energy of the earth element or the fire element or the water element or air element and so forth because, you know, they're connected to those divinities just like we are. They're animal totems that carry the energy of different divinities. There are plant totems, different plants. Every plant is categorized according to the energy complex it is descendant of. You have mineral totems you know, gold and silver and, you know, copper and the various metals, but also stones and so forth. Those are mineral totems. They carry different energetic signatures associated with specific divinities. And then you also have human totems, which are us. Afurakani, Afurakani people only. We are children of different divinities. So let's look quickly at our page on Second. Okay. So 
So we say divination or spiritual consultation is an integral component of all expressions of Nanasam, Afrakani, Afrakani ancestral religion. And here's the key to what why it's important. We're not just talking about fortune telling and are you going to get rich and things like that. We say through Adibisa, one learns from the Abosom, the deities, the forces of nature, and Nanano Samanfo, the nature, uh, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of our direct blood circles, spirit genetic blood circles, the nature of past, present, and potential future circumstances and events in relation to our thoughts, intentions, and actions as measured against the standard of Nyame Wa Nyame and Sheshe, which is divine order. Adibiso or divination operationalizes ancestral religion, Nanason. We talk about the incorporation of divine law and the restoration of divine balance. Adibisa is not only about seeking answers to overcome obstacles or exigencies, like if you have a uh, medical issue or something and if there's something going on, you're like, I need to get a reading to find out what's wrong. We also use divination, someone casting shells to learn something. Just as one can sit down and open up a book or log onto the internet to learn facts about various subjects to study, so do we use divination individually as well as going to a priest to priestess and so forth to learn about research and study any subject imaginable, the abosom and nananom and samanfo in concert with your okra, the divinity that governs your head, will inform, direct, and position you to come in contact with individuals and information concerning the subject you queried about for confirmation and further study. So when we engage in ritual divination, different forms of divination, Spirit possession is a form of divination with a human totem, mineral casting, bones, shells, and so forth. It's a form of divination. As we said, fire gazing, water gazing, and so forth. When we communicate with the forces in nature that regulate all of creation, plant life, animal life, mineral life, afurakani, afurakani, human life, if we want to know the nature of a particular plant, and if that plant is good for healing a certain condition like tumors in the ovaries and so forth, we need to learn that through divination, divination, through querying, through inquiring from the divinity, through the oracular process, what's the best means by which to deal with this? What's the best material to use to build a home or a structure? What's the best place to engage in farming? What's, is this land good for that or not? Maybe this land floods and we didn't know about that. Or maybe a for a certain number of years, the land is fertile and then, you know, something's going to happen where, you know, it's not going to be fertile any longer. What do we need to do? So we learn, you know, it's not just about, you know, emergencies, exigencies. It's about learning every aspect of how we're moving with regard to nation building, the seven principal values. What's the best means by which we need to approach this that will be in harmony with divine order? and therefore a furthering of our nation building, you know, endeavors. So we don't just use divination for quote unquote fortune telling. So that is why in that air element and so forth, divination, including spirit possession, spirit coming down and communicating. We get the, you know, we have to peer into any aspect of creation that we're dealing with, any aspect of life that we're dealing with. First, you become grounded, spiritually clear, aware, focused, not being pulled in different directions by other individuals or entities and so forth. Focus, clear, purified, detoxed and so forth. And now when you're ready to make decisions, build institutions, where's the best place to build this institution? What kind of structure are we gonna have in the institution? People make plans about different things all the time. People plan schools, they plan this and that. They usually use somebody else's blueprint, but who established the blueprint? What kind of blueprint should we lay down for an independent black school? What kind of curriculum should we have in our schools? Those who have independent schools and they're grounded in ancestral tradition, they would do divination first to see the best place to put the school, what grade the school are gonna be, 
how they're going to structure the curriculum and so forth. So it will be a holistic approach to education. The same thing with every aspect of, you know, life. So that, that's why that element is another okiade, a thing that is of necessity or urgency. So when we're building these structures and, you know, perpetuating these things that we've built, are the things we're doing in harmony with order. It's not just enough to come together and say Black people just need to come together no, mu no matter what our religious differences are. That's idiotic. When you become grounded through Nkong, you understand the foolishness of that state. People who are not grounded, they don't understand their culture, ancestral religion, and so forth, and how critical ancestral religion is to establishing something of quality with regard to nation building. Because they don't know that, they've been corrupted with fake religion. They say, well, we don't need to talk about religion. We need to keep that in the closet and so forth. And we just need to come together based on the fact that we're being oppressed. That will always fall apart because the basis of the oppression is the control of the mind. And when you're dedicated to fake religion and a fake divinity and fake values, then eventually that's going to overtake anything you're doing. That's why people come into conflict. When you, when you become grounded, you're no longer controlled by those false ideas and false ideologies. You're clear and open to reality. So then when you are ready to make decisions, first you consult the forces in nature that regulate order and creation. So you can bring that order to the school that you're building, to the business that you're building, to the relationship that you're building, to the healing practice that you're establishing. You have to be open to Adibisa inquiry so you can make proper decisions. But let me know if that um, answers the question that you had in the chat room. Now, the next piece is in Tang. The fire element. OK, so you said kind of. So now, what aspect of it was, what other aspect of it were you trying to get to? And if you want to unmute yourself, that's cool too. If you if you just want to ask the question. Okay, Hatep, can y'all hear me? That's up. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I guess my question is more so like, um, are particular individuals or some purified individuals um needed as more of a support um for an Okonfo or a Okonfowa to have that um full possession. Like, for example, when I watch, um, you know, Ajita festivals in Ghana, uh, you see those individuals, but they're usually supported by other individuals um, because potentially, you know, they're having this full possession, you know, they're kind of everywhere. Right. Um, I don't know if it's like a safety thing so they don't hurt themselves. Um, and I also see them having like a bell that they're using um, and that kind of like intensifies or some type of other object that intensifies um, the possession. So okay. like, is that, how do they need it for support, you know, for that to truly uh, take place fully? Or can, okay. uh, can that happen on their own? Okay, I see what you're saying. I'm gonna show, let me pull up this. Um... Okay, so we did an article on this. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. So we did an article on the Ochiame, which is the spokesperson of the king or queen. And it's directly related to what you're saying because when you see the, uh, not kind of culture, when you see the spokesperson with the staff and so forth, and we were showing that it's the same function in um, ancient Kemet with Tehuti with his staff. That's why we have him on the front cover. 
but Tahuti is the Ochiame or the spokesperson for the for the divinity for Amen and Amenet and Rod Right and so forth. Just like the Ochiame is the spokesperson for the king, queen mother. Um, you have male and female Ochiame, just like you have kings, queen mother. Here, this is a king and Ohenni. He has a spokesperson. So people don't speak directly to the king, the Ohenni. They speak to the spokesperson. Then he whispers in the ear to the Ohenni, and the Ohenni whispers back in his ear, and he, you know, communicates with the community. In the same way, what you're talking about with regard to seeing some Akom rituals, you'll see someone possessed by a divinity. Just like you see the king seat, seated here, the Ohenni seated here. And when the Ohenni or the Ohema, the king or the queen mother are seated on the Agua or the throne, they are possessed, they are perpetually possessed by the spirits of the other royal ancestresses and ancestors. So they're in a state of possession and so forth, even just culturally. Um, but you have a priest or priestess, an Okonfo, who is possessed with the divinity. And then you'll see them with an Ocheame. And they'll call them the Ocheame for that shrine house. And they'll have a towel with them. Sometimes, as you said, they have a bell with them. Um, sometimes the Abosom will whisper to them and they will tell people what the Abosom had to say. Sometimes the Abosom will say it out loud, but sometimes they will tell the, their, their attendant and so forth. And they, they do protect because sometimes the energy that comes down on the person is very heavy or strong and the person can fall over or, you know, they'll stand behind them or stand around them, make sure they don't, you know, fall into something. Um, so part of it is protective, but it's also channeling that energy from the, you know, person who's possessed through the Ochiame to broadcast it to the community. And if you see it in a large setting, a bunch of people out, out, you know, in a courtyard or whatever, and the spirit is possessing and a number of people at a communal ritual, or if it's in, you know, in a shrine house, you have the head priest, Obosomfo, sometimes you have an Okomfo there, but they also have Ocheame or, you know, spokespersons of the shrine house. Just like in the palace, the Ahemfie, you have the king, queen, mother, Oheni, Ohema, and then you have the Acheame, the spokespersons for, for the political apparatus. In a shrine house, the priest or the priestess is like the king or queen mother, and they have Acheame who are spokespersons for them as well. And they are a support system. And the Acheame, even for the king or queen mother, they will, part of their function is not just communicating, but it's also a spiritual. People who would try to project negative energy towards the Oheni, the king and queen mother, the Ochiame's job is to capture that and redirect it and repel it as a defense for the sovereign. So they're not just, you know, Europeans who write about the Ochiame, they say, well, they're linguists, they're spokespersons, they're messengers for the king and queen mother, and that's it. And they just have a staff that's an ornate looking staff. But the staff is a talisman. They know ritually how to receive negative energy and repel it and project it back onto somebody coming into the court, you know, just like if somebody came into the court and tried to, you know, came into somebody's, you know, business and tried to, you know, um, poison the president or the CEO. And somebody took the drink before they, you know, gave it to the CEO and, you know, checked it out and found out it was poison. And then they had the person arrested. You know, the Ojeame captures that negative energy projected and redirects it back to the individual. So. But yes, people, there are supportive positions. You have Okonfo, Okonfoa, Abosomfo, who are priests and priestesses. And then they have Ochiame in the shrine house. That's part of the shrine house structure. Okay. Okay, but let me know if that, that answers the question. Okay, you don't say. Okay, so that entain piece is what we're talking about. So um, let me scroll down real quick. So we had the Ohia, we had that definition. We talked about calm. We just talked about Adebisa consultation inquiry and so forth. Now, entain to be straight, 
right, correct, convenient, agreeable. And let's flip over to We're talking about elemental asceticism. So tain means to be straight. And the root of tain is te, to be straight, to be rec upright, right, right, correct, and so forth. And then we talked about, you know, ascetic um, practice, rigorous self-denial as religious exercise, one rigorous in self-denial and so forth. So, you know, they talk about the term, the ascetics and so forth, who abstain from food and sexual activity and a number of different things to so detox themselves and purify themselves and so forth. And they always associate that with, you know, like Hinduism or Jainism or Buddhism or very often these Asian practices or some early Christian monks and so forth, but they took that from the priests and priestesses of ancient Kemet. And then we can even show um, chapter 30 of the Rudu Pert in Peru. Just an example, it said, shall be recited this chapter by a person purified and washed Wab means to purify, abu, wabu, and also tura, which is jira or jira, purified and washed, has not eaten animal flesh or a fish. So they're talking about this ritual invocation should be chanted and so forth by someone who has been purified, washed, and they haven't consumed animal flesh or a fish. That's a form of abstinence. And that is a form of asceticism. So we have these four elements once again, and then we showed specific things with regard to the yearly cycle, the summer solstice, you know, autumn equinox, winter solstice, spring equinox, and so forth. And you can see this is the spring, the summer, autumn, winter, and so forth. And then the midpoints. So you will see that you know, this ancient Akan symbol represents that sacred cycle. This is the Okra symbol in the Akan tradition, two different versions of that Okra symbol. And you'll see that the cross structure exists and then the X structure here, but it's the, those eight different portions along that um, circle. The four cardinal points, but also the in-between points. And when you look at the equinoxes and solstices, the shift of the seasons, the midpoints are sacred points as well. And we've always recognized that. Europeans kind of cloak those midpoints and other practices, but the midpoint between the spring equinox and summer solstice is May 1st. If you look on a calendar, it'll say May day. The midpoint between June 22nd, the summer solstice and the autumn equinox is August 2nd. Previously, that used to be the day of the dead or ancestral spirits and so forth before they switched it. Um, then you have the autumn equinox, you know, first day of fall. The midpoint is November 4th. That's the sacred energy point in between the equinox and the solstice. They'll say that's all saints day, November 1st and so forth. Then you have the winter solstice. And then you have the midpoint is February 2nd, like 40 days after the solstice. And you'll see on the calendar that's groundhog's day and so forth. So, you have sunrise, even according to the day, that's sunrise, you know, mid-spring, mid-noon, which is mid-summer and so forth, mid-summer, um, fall, mid-autumn, you know, uh, winter and so forth. Sunrise is akin to the spring, uh, noon, high noon and so forth, hottest time of the day is akin to the summer solstice, hottest time of the year. Fall is akin to the evening point, the evening 6 p.m. 
when the sun is crossing the evening point. That's also the other evening or balancing point, equinox, equal nights, 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. And then mid midnight is akin to the winter solstice, the longest day of the year, 15 hours of darkness, nine hours of night and so forth. So that's also akin to the days, you know, sunrise, noon, sunset, you know, midnight, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter, but then you have these sacred midpoints where the energy is shifting in the cycle. We talk about the sprouting, maturing, full flowering, crystallizing, the seeding and harvest time, which is now, then germination, then rooting, then rising. That also has to do with the manifestation of your behavior in the behavioral cycle. And let's just switch over to that real quick. Pull this up real quick. In the first uh, Ojeda Mine book, we published our article dealing with the pair Agnut. And just to touch on this piece that we just um, Mentioned we were talking about the seeding, rooting, germination, you know, sprouting and full flowering and so forth, that whole cycle, as you can see here. And then we talk about it in terms of the behavioral cycle. So seeding, embedding, germination, rooting, and all of that. And then we talk about that with contact. If you, when you read that section, you'll see we're talking about, let me just go back up. We're talking about when you have experiences that seated in your consciousness, stimulates your physical and spiritual senses, then that experience get root, gets rooted and stimulates the root energy of your being and so forth. <clears throat> And then you either develop certain ideas, thoughts, or intentions about what you just experienced. Then you have an emotional reaction. That's, that's the sprouting, <clears throat> an energetic reaction. And then you act upon you know, your thoughts and so forth. And that is the act, the full flowering of your thoughts and intentions. And then your harvest or seeding, you harvest the results of your actions. So you experience something, it stimulates something deep within you, whether it's stimulating the root energy of your being or it stimulates your conditionings, your negative conditionings, and you have an automatic response or it stimulates the root energy of your being and you formulate thoughts and intentions about how you're going to respond based on the, you know, divine order. Then you have a sprouting and energy reaction, which is the manifestation of your you know, thoughts and then you engage in physical acts, express physical acts and so forth, which is a manifestation of your intentions. And then you have to harvest the results of whatever you've done, whether it's positive or negative. So we're talking about that in the context of the behavioral cycle. So anytime we engage in any action, we go through that entire cycle. And it's important to know that cycle. You can read that whole 40 plus page article or 26 page article. Um, so you can understand where you're being triggered, what, you know, phases of that, you know, behavioral cycle that you're stuck in. So when you engage in ritual meditation, you can purify that aspect of yourself, but you can read that whole article. It's in the Ojira Mind Journal, number one. You can see that in detail, but with regard to intain or discipline, just like you have these fire, water, and earth elements, We also have these expansive and contractive aspects of that. So for example, in the earth element, 
the grounding element that has to do with diet, the things that you're putting in your body. On the intain side, that's abstaining from food. So you, on one hand, on the expansive side, you, you know, eat, nourish yourself, energize yourself, put the right things in your body to strengthen yourself so you can function properly every day, harmoniously every day. On the contractive side is fasting when you're purifying yourself and you abstain from that. You notice some people say, well, I could never fast for seven days or 21 days. They don't know the control that they have over themselves. They've given their control away. They're controlled by food and lust and misguided desire. But when you say, I'm going to fast for seven days or 21 days and you go through the process, you learn how to actually exercise the control that you actually have. And you know for sure that you do have control because you wield the control. You're in control of your body, you're in control of your appetites and so forth. And when you can fast, then it's people can't control you with certain, you know, ideas or thoughts or dangling things in front of you, certain, you know, promises and so forth. If you can deny yourself from food and not be controlled by that, one of the basic drives of life, then people can't control you. But if you can't even stop eating, then people can control you with anything. If you can't control your palate, you can't, you don't have control. You do have the capacity for that, but we've been conditioned to believe that we cannot. So when you engage in, you know, um, fasting, detoxification, purification, it's one thing for purification, but on the other side, it's about learning how to wield your own control, exercise your own power, being disciplined, entertain this sexual activity to bring other ancestral spirits into the world. Every time you have a child, you're bringing an ancient ancestor, ancestors back into the world. Now you have a responsibility to raise that ancestral spirit into his, his or her true nature. But then on the contractive side is abstinence. If you learn through discipline, through experience that you do have control, 100% absolute control over sexual activity, then you can't be controlled by somebody who tries to use that to control you. You see that happening, as we said earlier, with people who are, you know, um, uh, heads of these various organizations. Look at these various organizations or individuals who are popular, building businesses and so forth and putting, putting themselves in front of the Black community as leaders and so forth. And they always end up having major sex scandals because something as simple as someone trying to entice them with sexual activity, they fall for it because they have no intain, no basic intain or discipline. But discipline from food or abstinence from food or sexual activity, cyclical fasting and you know um, abstinence and so forth, that is part of our ancestral culture. We just saw in ancient Kemet said, this chapter is to be read by somebody who's not eating animal flesh or fish. There's another chapter talking about someone who hasn't engaged in sexual activity. So there are certain forms of cyclical fasting, um, abstinence and so forth that we engage in so we can exercise our own control over ourselves in a holistic fashion so that we know we have absolute control over everything we do. And we can't be controlled by anything else. Um, so you have exercise on the expansive side, but then you have balance, ritual balance and so forth on the contractive side. You have ritual movement, which can be ritual dance or quote unquote yoga and so forth, but we have different forms of movement. But then you also have stillness, which is meditation. Some people will say, well, I can't sit still. I can't meditate. I can't sit still for too long. It's too, too much. They've been conditioned to believe that they cannot sit still and be focused and become internalized. But when you engage in that, not only do you prove to yourself you have complete control over your own body, but also you can go inward so that you can engage in, in calm spirit communication so you can learn what you need to learn and do what you need to do. So that's why in Tain, elemental asceticism, not just in the hoodoo tradition, but just in general, the different elements are associated with these different ascetic practices. And we did a whole four-week course on that. Um, 
So, and we also did a four week or a six week course on, um, let's just pull this up real quick so you can see it. In addition to that course, when we we're talking about the elements with regard to that, we did a six week course on that we call ab and have to do a cyclical fasting and ritual abstinence. Just find that real quick. Okay. And once again, this is another one that is, uh, you can access this online. It's a six week course, $15 course. Ritual celibacy is cyclical fasting for alignment. So we talk about the term ab, which means um, to purify and uh, something pure, but it also means cessation and so forth. And we talk about that because that's that's critical, not only to, you know, just for your own well-being, fasting, detoxing, not being controlled by, you know, certain things with regard to diet. When people are obese, overweight, you know, consuming things with this, different foods or drugs and so forth, alcohol, marijuana, different things, cigarettes, all these things that are destroying us and they can't seem to stop. We have the capacity and the responsibility and it's part of our culture to engage in ritual celibacy, cyclical fasting. That's always been part of our culture. At some point, at certain periods, we engage in these things to purify ourselves and also learn how to take absolute control over ourselves so nobody or no thing can control us through our basic drives for reproduction and consumption. Okay, and the final one. Is the sun setting? The equinox, which is actually tomorrow, you know, the aho sign element. So just like in Tain, asceticism is an ohiadie, is a priority in order to be effective at nation building. Aho sign, and what does aho sign mean? We can look at the term in Akan. Sign means to return. Ahun means self, so aho sign means self return or restoration, returning to the self, vindication and so forth. So let's look at what that has to do with. Um, second. So once again, we did a four week course on this. As we said earlier, elemental restoration, aho sign means to return to the self of restoration. So it means restoration recovery. Sign means to return and who means self. In the spiritual context, this, a reference, this reference is restoration, recovery from spiritual discordance. It is a return to aligning with our divine function in creation when through lack of insight and ritual purification, one allows internalized conditionings or externalized external pressure from physical or non-physical individuals or entities to derail one's focus disorder prevails in life. The natural cyclical manifestation of behavior governed by the four elements becomes corrupted. It is through elemental purification that we restore our focus and thus divine order to our lives. We say the grounding nature of Asasi earth is restoration from addiction. The rooting depths of Nsuo water is restoration from depression. The sprouting expressions of Mframa air is restoration from anxiety. The flowering expansion of fire or Ja is restoration from irateness. We align with the Abosum deities animating the four elements and their expressions including the four seasons, four cardinal points, four divisions of the day cycle, and four full division of the soul divine consciousness reflected in our cosmogram. So
You can engage in purification. You can start nation building. You can do the various things that you normally do. And you start off, you become clear. Let's go back to our chart. And this is the critical piece. You have certain things that are foundational, lay the groundwork for different things. So we have, as we said earlier, in calm, you become grounded, purified, open, clear. So you're ready to receive messages, detoxifying yourself, purifying yourself, these different things. So you're open and clear. You're not weighed down by other misinformation, false ideologies. You clear all of that out, become focused and clear. You sit at your shrine, you engage in meditation, you're focused clear to get these messages. You engage in Adibisa to communicate with the spirit realm as a clear out person, clean, purified person. Now you can engage the spirit realm, get the information you need in order to build focus, not only individually, but as a, you know, with regard to nation building. Start putting these places, plans in order. You have to have discipline in saying you learn and develop discipline so you can continue to build upon the things that you've learned about. You learned about things throughout Ibiza. You put schools in place, healing practices in place, agricultural product projects in place, entrepreneurship in place. You engage in cyclical fasting and, you know, ritual celibacy and, and all these different things to remain disciplined so you can continue to build the schools and expand the schools and build the business, expand the business and everything that you're doing, it takes discipline to get up every day and do that. That's part of our culture. Everything is going fine at this point, but at some point you have challenges. You have major challenges that attack every aspect of what you're doing. And sometimes people become derailed. They fall off track because they haven't achieved perfection yet. When we become nananum mpanyinfo, or spiritually cultivated elders and elderses, we achieve spiritual balance that's consistent. That's what akeru or perfection is. We're consistently aligned with divine order. Every thought, every intention, every moment of every day, we crystallize into that as elders and elders. That's part of our, our inheritance. This notion that there's no such thing as perfection and nobody's perfect is nonsense. For white people, yes. They don't know what perfection is. They, they have no concept of that. They, they can't even conceive of. They incarnate as spirits of disorder. They will never not only conceive of perfection, but they can't achieve that. This is part of our inheritance. We're expected to crystallize into that, just like you're expected to grow into old age, you're expected to crystallize into the kind of elder or elderess that gets up every day and operates in a harmonious fashion, is not controlled by lust or misguided desire or idiocy or ignorance or you know, misguided emotionalism. They're beyond all of that. They get up and do what they need to do every day and they're not controlled by anything else. Until you get to that point, sometimes things will happen and it may derail you spiritually until you get to the point where you've achieved mastery, self-mastery. Until you get to that point, there are some things or some, some things that may happen externally or internally that can derail you spiritually. And we must have a process, a whole sign for self-restoration or recovery to get back on track or else all our nation building projects fall apart. And we've seen that with individuals, as we said, with these major organizations or individuals who are teaching and trying to form the community and so forth. And the next thing you know, they're derailed by misguided emotionalism or, you know, some sex scandal or some scandal within, you know, the interactions with the people and their negative interactions with people and the organization falls apart and so forth because some people are controlled by lust or power or money or whatever it is. They, they haven't purified themselves, they haven't detoxed, they haven't been focused or clear, they haven't sought you know, direction from the Abosomen and Samanfo to plug that into what they're doing. But, or if they have done that, old conditionings from childhood or adulthood or old traumas and so forth rise up and it derails them and they don't have a process in place to recover. The derailing is going to come, the challenges are gonna to come, do you have a process in place culturally to recover. 
and aho sign is the process. And when we have that process in place, we know that things are going to derail. Just like when you have a, you know, when you have a, a system, if you if you have your laptop or you know some system like Zoom and so forth. They know certain things that can happen that will derail the process and they have a backup system in place just in case things are derailed, you have recovery. You have backup systems on your iPhone and so forth. At some point, there's going to be a challenge and you need to have that backup system just in case you need to restore or recover. Just like we put those things in place with regard to you know, technology, we need to have that in place with regard to social technology and that's what AhoSign is. It's a backup or recovery or restoration system so things, once they are challenged or derailed, they don't remain derailed and destroy the entire nation building restoration process, we can recover and restore. If you don't have that in place, which many of these organizations don't, you see his, historically, true historically, how they've fallen apart. Even for the ones who were still, you know, and part of it had to be, had to do with the the foolish philosophy that they try to be grounded with in the first place. If their whole nation building process was grounded in Judeo-Christian values or Islamic values or secular atheistic values and so forth, they were doomed from the start. So all we have to do is look past over the past hundred plus years, none of these movements have produced sovereignty and security in our sovereignty independence and so forth, and have never come close to that. They were derailed from the beginning with the fake philosophy. But even when they were moving along and trying to do certain things, at some point when the challenges came, they were not able, able to overcome those challenges. And you see these leaders falling from grace and so forth, splits within the community and so forth, and offshoots, and some people who were hungry for power, and they wanted to be in charge, and they wanted to have the spotlight and, you know, sexual impropriety and all kinds of nonsense because people didn't have these things in place. Now, part of part of the, we talked about these three journals on the OG Online page, the link is in the chat room. In the first journal, we just, showed the flowering and sprouting and rooting and all of that. Um, the Per Agnut article. Part of it was talking about the behavioral cycle, but then we also talk about later in the article. The role of the deities and the priests and priestesses, the role of the ancestral spirits and the elders and eldresses and so forth. And we get into the divisions of that cycle or circle. And we talk about the right hemisphere dealing with ritual purification, healing, the left hemisphere dealing with cultural purification and governing. And that's what we were talking about with regard to the right hemisphere and left hemisphere, ritual purification, the deities in the quote unquote underworld and their representatives on earth above ground are the priests and priestesses, the ancestral spirits in the underworld and spirit realm and above ground, their representatives on earth are the umpanyinfo, the elders and elderesses. We have that spiritual and cultural grounding and governing, then we have the Aho sign cultural structure in place so that we can fall back on our cultural structure so we can recover. So when you read through that, you'll see what we're talking about with regard to Aho sign. And we also did a four week course on Aho sign, but we talked about the difference between when you're grounded, that earth element, then you make proper decisions and, and so forth. But if you fall away from that grounding, instead of being grounded in truth and divine order and so forth and making decisions that reflect that, you become attached or grounded to something that's out of harmony with order and that's addiction. That's a corruption of real grounding. If you become rooted 
and so forth. And let's scroll down. We have the, so you see grounding, nature of Asase, earth, of course, restoration from addict, addiction. The rooting, you see the roots go deep in the soil and so forth and grab the water that's deep within the soil, gets nourished and so forth. Roots, rooting depths of nsuo, water. But if you go deep, and you lose your grounding, your deepness, you just fall into deepness, you become falling deep into depression and you don't have anything to hold on to. So the corruption of being rooted is depression. But when you get back to that water element, you engage in ritual practice, you become rooted in the true sense and you, you know, it's a recovery or restoration from depression. Sprouting is the expression of your energetic, you know, capacity, quote unquote, emotions. Air element, you know, like spring, sprouting, the roots breaking through the surface of the soil. You're seeing what was happening underground, it manifests in the world. So that's expression, that's the sprout. <clears throat> your energetic expression, your emotional expression, Something happens, certain activities take place, certain circumstances, and then you have a surge of energy expression. That's a fire, oh, sorry, air element, and frama and so forth. If it's a natural expression based on order and so forth, it's a good expression. It's a, it's a truthful expression. It's something that's in harmony with order. People can take from that and be inspired by it. But if it's out of harmony with order, that expression manifests a kind of discordant energy expression, which is manifests as anxiety. So but when you're engaged in ritual practice, this restoration from anxiety. And then the full flowering process of fire or ja, fully flowering the full actions and engaging act in activity, that's nation building activity. And you're utilizing that fire to make these things happen. You're building, you're structuring, you're organizing, you're actually doing it. You're doing the work and you're using the fire to fuel the work that's in harmony with order. And people are impacted, inspired by that, by that in a harmonious way. But if you're corrupted, derailed, then that fire energy begins to consume you and you become irate, self-destructive. There's a productive fire that keeps everybody warm and keeps, you know, the fuel going and, you know, fire it up and so forth. Without fire, you would, of course, without the sun, everything is gonna die. Everything is dependent on the sun, on this entire planet, the entire solar system, of course. So fire is essential to our life. This life force energy moving through you is that solar fire. So that's productive, it's generative. You need fire, heat to, you know, stimulate the growth of crops and everything else, but, if you're self-destructive, then you'll burn yourself up. You have fire that you use to destroy the enemy that's in harmony with divine order. But if you turn that fire on yourself because you're not engaged in you know, harmonious activity, you become burned up, irate, self-destructive, and you turn that fire on people who you should be supporting. The fire is for the enemy, not for your own people. So, but we did a whole four week course on that so we can learn how to utilize these elements and the abosom connected to these elements and our ritual practices to be restored. We do not have to leave our ancestral culture to get ourselves together. It's not like we study philosophy and talk about African culture, Afurakani, Afurakani culture and religion. But as soon as something goes wrong, then we end up going to a psychiatrist's office or you know, a psychologist or you know, somebody in Western medicine to get it taken care of because we believe that in our own culture, we can't solve any problems. It's just to talk about philosophy. When something really happens, we have to go to the enemy and their inferior culture to get us together. That's insane. And when people do that, that means they don't, number one, understand their own culture. They were never taught that. And number two, they don't have any confidence in themselves and their own culture. They really think that our culture is inferior and we're totally dependent when it comes down to it on our enemies' fake religions and fake philosophies. 
psychology is just full, full of false ideas and foolish philosophies of the white narrow spray. And then they cherry pick certain things from Afurakani, Afurakani culture and pretend like it's something that they created. But even that, when they do that, it's corrupt. Same thing with the Western medicine. We have our own holistic approaches to medicine as well as you know spiritual balance, which they would call engaging in psychology or psychiatry and so forth. But we, we don't have to leave our culture to address our issues. In fact, when we do that, they're never addressed. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, so that is the uh, information we wanted to um, go over tonight. Um, one question, you so said, you mentioned before, what is the traditional food offering for the Nananom Unsamapo in our Khan culture? So one of the traditional food offerings is what's called Eta, and it's mashed yam, and boiled eggs and uh, palm oil. So the mashed yam is similar to mashed potatoes in North America and so forth, but it's the, you know, the yam. You see there are different kinds of yam that are popular in Ghana. And if you go to, you know, African grocery stores, sometimes you see African Caribbean or African Mexican um, grocery stores, you see the big Ghana yam. They're usually called the Ghana yam. Um, but you, you skin it and you boil it just like you do, you know, potatoes and so forth. And they, they mash the yam, use the palm oil. It's not palm kernel oil, it's palm oil. And then boiled eggs as well. That's a traditional food offering. But we also give them whatever food that we are eating, we take a little portion. When you see people practice ancestral tradition, you'll see no matter where they are, a restaurant, it could be a fast food restaurant, whatever it is, and you see them sitting down eating, you'll see they have a little bit of food on the side of their plate, food over. That's for the insumanfo. When you're at home, you take a portion of the food that you're eating and give it to the shrine and so forth or on the side of the plate. Um, but also certain things that our people, you know, were accustomed to eating here. Sometimes people make coffee and, you know, certain juice and so forth and put it out there for the insomnia and, and a plate of the food that they, they are eating communally. They'll take a small plate or bowl and put some of that on the shrine as well. So that Ghana yam is like a, it's a big um, tuber. It's, it's like a white yam basically. But usually if you go to certain African slash, very often certain cities, they have an African slash Mexican store or just African, you know, grocery store and so forth. They usually call it a Ghana yam. But then some, they get it from other places as well. Nigeria and other places like that. But um, it's, it's that that white yam. And it's the palm, palm oil. So they have palm kernel oil and palm oil, but it's the palm oil, not the palm kernel. But the term is, let me put that in the chat room. Eto, eto, that's the term. And sometimes they'll say oto, but some people pronounce it eto, but that's that traditional food. Sometimes people include plantains with that, but that plantains, of course, you know, we didn't start, that, that came from over here and it was imported over there. So that's not like a quote unquote traditional, even though people, because people be, incorporated that in the diet, people will, you know, give that as well. So even if you if you went to some, say for example, you went to a quote unquote African restaurant, Ghanaian restaurant, a Liberian restaurant, and you got some jollof rice and um, spinach and plantains and so forth, you know, you set aside a little bit of each of that, you know, those items and put it to the side for your insomnia. If you were at home and you took a little bowl and to plantain and spinach and, you know, um, jollof rice and put it to the side for your insomnia, that's, that's what's done. 
or whatever food that you're preparing yourself, a portion of it set aside. Okay, so there are a couple of things coming up. We're gonna have some information on our upcoming Who Do Mind, Who Do Nation Festival. We'll have that coming up next week. We're gonna post the information about what's going on with that. We also have October 7th, we're gonna have a pre-release special screening of our new documentary film. It's gonna be released in mid-October, but the special pre-release screening, online screening, that's gonna be our October 7th. <clears throat> this is our Conche Film, <clears throat> Conche Films website. Excuse me. In fact, I'll just put the uh, the link to Eventbrite. So if you wanna buy tickets for that, <clears throat> it's gonna be October 7th, we're gonna do it. Um, the screening will be on YouTube and so forth. Just for the people, of course, who signed up, got the tickets. Let me put the link. Okay, that's the Eventbrite link. You'll see it says Saturday, Saturday October 7th, um, $11.11 for the tickets. You'll see that we have the, oh, we did a short trailer. There's gonna be another trailer coming out as well. Uh, like Puru Akan Ancestry Legend in North America. And that's coming up. So this is our second film for those who are unaware. But we're, the film is focused on the Hudu tradition and how specifically the Akan Ancestry Legend in North America and various aspects of the Hudu tradition. So that's what we're getting into. The first of its kind. We're the ones who prove that Hudu is the Akan tradition. People were believing that hoodoo is just another name for voodoo, which of course is not. They thought that hoodoo was an amalgamation of different African traditions, which of course is not, or trying to say it's part Native American, which is nonsense, or European, which is nonsense. Um, they would say hoodoo doesn't have any deities and it's not a religion, it's just dealing with roots and herbs and so forth, which is totally inaccurate. The root work aspect is only one eighth of the hoodoo tradition. There's a full pantheon of deities in the hoodoo tradition, the hoodoo spirits, the hoodoo deities, and so forth. We are the ones to prove that the word hoodoo is Akan, the word moja, mojo is Akan, paint, conjure, all these different things. We go into detail about that in the film. So, so yet I say to those of you who have, you know, bought tickets already, but we do have those tickets available. And also, we have our tour to Kamet and Kanit coming up June 4th through June 12th. So if you would like, we have a couple of spaces left open, open for that tour. So if you would like to join us in Kamet, you'll see the page, the Arikat page. We have a number of videos from the previous tour when we went um, 12 different cities from Northern Kemet all the way into Southern Kemet and into Anit, Nubia and so forth, so-called Abu Simbel, the various temples and tombs and shrine spaces that we visited. So you'll see these different videos showing different places that we went. But we have that coming up June 4th through the 12th. And we have information, we sent out an email about there were two discounted spaces left, the 30% discount, so instead of 3,000, it's 1,500. But just for those two spaces, we can't do that for everybody. We just had a couple of spaces for that. Um, but we also have payment plans to put a $300 deposit down and you can pay monthly until, you know, through next spring until you pay, pay it off and you decide how much you want to pay monthly through the site. There are also aspects of, you know, PayPal has their own financing piece. So you make a, you know, if you're approved through PayPal credit, then you can stretch it out over 12 or 24 months. So you don't have to pay everything up front if you're approved and so forth. So there are different approaches to, um, you know, the installment payment, payment options for the tour. But we have a few spaces left open for the tour, June 4th through June 12th. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and end it here. We are a little bit over the time we wanted to go. 
Um, we're gonna post this video on our page once we, you know, edit and save it and everything, so you'll have access to it. Um, all the links, you'll see the links to the books and everything. Our thirty-one books you can download for free. You'll see that on the page and so forth. Um, you can download the Ojira Mind journals for the first three years we published a journal. You can download those um, and the classroom page. The you know Akongwa Suya page with all of our 38 online courses. And let me just show you that right quick. So the Akongwa Suya page is the page that we were showing earlier. And that's just a collage picture of all the 38 courses that we've taught to date. Um, we do have a couple of bundles, like the nine, nine of those courses were on the Hoodoo tradition, are on the Hoodoo tradition. So you can purchase all nine Hoodoo courses for $50. We also have the four course set, in total two Sinead parts one and two, the bio spirituality of the goddesses, female divinities and their biological corresponding, you know, structures in the body and so forth. Two six week courses, 12 weeks total. And then by E.T. Seneb, two separate six week courses, parts one and part two, the marriages of the divinities. So the cosmology of divine twin flame marriage. We talk about this notion of twin flame and where they got it from, but the marriages of the deities as models for our unions, like Shu and Tefnut and Osar and Aset, Amen and Amenet, Ra and Ra'et, Atem and Atemet, Main Tu and Tananet, um, Geb and Nud and Set and Nebuhet, Hapi and Merit, um, Men and Hederu and so forth. So the various you know, marriages of the divinities, that's gonna be important. It's always important, but this year, tomorrow is New Year's Day, which is a Saturday, Miminida. And for us, the day that the new year begins on colors the entire year. So Min Minida is Saturday. That is a day governed by the divinity Min. And let me just show you real quick. We have an image of them. The deity The deity is Min, and Het Heru in her form is Min Mini. So Min and Min Mini, they govern Min Minida, which is Saturday. Um, the planet Aminni, which the white snarl spring calls Saturn, we call Aminni. And the male divinity is Amin Min. The female divinity is Min Mini, which is a form of Het Heru and so forth. And since New Year's Day this year happens to be on a Min, Min, Min Minida or Saturday, the deities Min and Het Heru um govern that day and govern the the year and that has to do with the balance of male and female and marriages and so forth so this would be an auspicious year for marriages divine union that kind of thing coming together complementary balance and so forth so this particular these particular courses parts one and two on cosmology of divine twin flame marriage it's always important, but it'd be especially important this year. So people who are entering into these kinds of unions or, or already have, but want to strengthen that, they will see how the deities, marriages interact, how the interplay of their energy balanced with regard to one another and how that can be reflected and should be reflected in our relationships. So, so that's one of those course bundles, those four courses for $40, but when you scroll through, you'll see all the, you know, courses, the original flyers for them, and all of them are either $10 or $15. There's only a couple of them that are like $22 a seven week courses. And the manual course is 13 weeks, so it's 44. But all the other um, ones are like either 10 or $15. Okay, so once again, Yerase, say we thank everybody for joining us and Yebeshia Bio. We will meet again at Tuffy.